Hello, and welcome to Dataversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Plus Anything Awesome founder, Dr. Peter Aiken, about his career in data. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager at Dataversity. And this is my career in data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to talk with people who help make those careers a little easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And today we are joined by Dataversity partner, Dr. Peter Aiken. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Peter, hello and welcome. Yeah, and it's always so good to hear your voice as we've been doing for these past 11 years of working together. It's true, yeah, we've been producing a webinar for 11 years. Can you believe it? Yep. And uh, by the way, the woman who had that idea was Jeannie Laughlin, and she has gone on to be super successful in her uh, ideas thing, but I always want to thank her for getting it started and you guys, of course. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Data Ed Online, a monthly webinar uh, series we do the first Tuesday of each month on uh, various things. It's always a blast um, and obviously uh, successful enough to keep doing it, right? I just, uh, it's fun. Um, So let's talk about you. Let's talk about your career in data management. So what's your current job title, or should I say appropriately job titles? You have a few. Uh, And what do you do? What are your responsibilities under those jobs? Well, I have to start out and say that I've been at Virginia Commonwealth University since 1977. And uh, because I'm tenured there, they get uh, absolute first dibs on everything, including the fact that they own all the uh, intellectual property in my head, all the thoughts that I have, part of the deal that we do with, uh, with that particular piece. I uh, became a professor there in 1993, and I did have a, a career before that, which was a lot of fun. Um, in fact, I was uh, one of the first students to go through the university without typing punch cards. And uh, I just happened to have them right here in case anybody doesn't know that this is how we used to do computing in the old days. And, uh, Got to learn at the hands of the masters in that process as well, but uh, it was uh, quite a, a thing in those days because they didn't even lock computer rooms. Um, you know, we were just allowed sort of on the four, fourth floor at uh, what is now called Harris Hall at VCU. And is, is that because they were too big to steal? <laughs> well, nobody was going to steal a computer. You're right. Uh, <laughs> Although just quick deviation, you remember when Beamers came out, the overhead projectors, we lost one of those at the university at one point and found out one of the fraternities had grabbed it to go watch a football game and they were going to put it back. So it was (laughs) good old school. But uh, yeah, it was uh, the the computers in those days, you would run these stacks of cards through them and it would do things. And I found I liked that. In fact, my advisor said to me, well, I was going to become a lawyer. Um, I thought that was where I was headed. And so... My advisor at that point sat down and said, look, Peter, let's do a little bit of math. There are currently 200 million Americans and there are 2 million lawyers. So you can do the math. That's one lawyer for every 100 Americans. (laughs) Probably not. And this was in the days when lawyers were driving taxi cabs in New York City. What a shame. Uh, Obviously, things change and and careers go up and down as, as far as all that goes. Um, But she said, actually, you're one of fewer than 200,000 people in the entire world that understands computers at this point in time, and you're already there. So I would think that would be a much better career path. And I, you know, had to have that sort of hit over the head with a a two by four to, okay, yes, thank you very much. You know, it's eternally grateful. And it's been a great relationship with the university ever since. And I've tried to give back to, you know, what the students have gotten, because I got a terrific education out of the process. And I've had a a fabulous career. And I'm, I'm super happy to to be able to document a little bit of it and hope that it can benefit others. So what is it you're currently teaching at the university? Uh, I tend to teach graduate level courses that are projects. And the the real challenge I think that we have in the university is how to make it relevant. BCU calls it experiential learning. And my classes are all focused on the process of actually doing things. Uh, Just to take one example, data scientists in today's environment are often uh, sort of complained about because they don't have enough interest in learning the whole scope of the project. They just want to focus on the the fun parts, which is the algorithm. Uh, I can remember going into classes and students go, you know, when can we start the clustering, right? And it's like, yeah, uh, get interested in the question before you start doing the clusters. Uh, Although there is 
obviously wisdom going the back of the other direction. But letting them see what the rest of this is, and we tend to work with a real life um, customer, if you will, it's typically a state agency, but they get to work through these projects. And I'm fortunate that I teach two or three a semester and it works very nicely. And, and uh, hopefully the clients are, are enjoying the process. They tend to keep coming back and, and working with them. Certain, you know, they, they tend to report when they go out of here that those are some of the more important um, classes that they've taken, although it certainly doesn't seem like it at the time because you're in the middle of things, as you are, Shannon, with uh, yep. everything that you keep running, right? Yeah. So you're a professor at the university, and so, um, but what, and you also have a second job and career. You own a, your own company. Tell me about that. That's with the university. Uh, so they are co owners in anything awesome. And okay. um, it's specifically, again, designed to focus on capitalizing the intellectual property that we have. So Data Blueprint was also co owned by the university and uh, it contributed back into the university. So I like to introduce myself as a professor with a positive cash flow. Yeah. Uh, kind of not what most people think about from professor perspectives, but you know, it tends to work in my case. I, I don't mean that, that I want money, but it's nice to have resources that you can use to help other people. And that, that you know, again, gets to another hat, which is the president of DEMA. Um, sure, I've sure. been associated with that organization for decades. And uh, you know, the goal of what we do is to make this process easier. I was talking to somebody at our last conference, Shannon, where we were last in person back in December. Uh, and, and this individual was working for a specific type of state agency, uh, you know, we'll just say it's a health department or something. And all of a sudden you have this, you know, insight, which isn't too insightful, but there are 50 state agencies that are all trying to learn about data governance at the same time. And, you know, probably a good percentage of them were at the event that, that you threw uh, in order to do that. But at the same time, what a shame that they should have to go through and learn this individually. And then you can take that step a step further, which is every knowledge worker in your organization currently is has learned data on their own and they've probably not learned it optimally and so that's really sort of where i'm focusing what years i have uh to be able to contribute at this point but you know that's that's the kind of thing that's going on in terms of, of uh, uh, uh well, let's just say the danger to the citizenry right <laughs> sure. So, okay. So uh, you also threw in a third title in there, which is president of DEMA. So tell me a little about DEMA and what your role is there. DEMA is going through a transition as all organizations do, but this is a, a great one for DEMA to experience. We've operated more as a club because we had dozens of constituents as in the chapters of DEMA and you know, tried to work things. We don't really have a tight confederation. We have what would be called a loose confederation. And we've moved in the past couple of years to an organization that has to focus more on service. And so, you know, literally we're looking at things like help desk queues and, and things like that. And as the organization matures and grows up and, and tries to do the kinds of things that you need to do in order to serve a, a user membership base that's measured in thousands of, of uh, really anxious data professionals who want to be part of this. Uh, and what we want to do is create resources so that they can, can stop doing it individually by themselves. But it's all, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, however you want to think about it. But it's it's that grand of an idea. So you're part of DamaInternational.org. It's a nonprofit, right? And and again, just to reiterate, it's part is to help data professionals. Uh, and you're, correct That's me if I'm wrong. Organization. Yeah, you're, you're working to standardize some of the things, right, around surrounding uh, data? Well, internally, in terms of operations, yes. We, we, we're changing from an organization that was very clubby in nature to an organization that has to be service driven. And so that's what we're trying to do is strengthen our internal systems, make sure that when people ask us questions, we can respond right away, that we can be a good business partner uh, and that we can be of, of good value to our membership. I love it. So you, you mentioned you wanted to be a lawyer when you grew up or, or when you initially started in your college. Not sure up yet, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that, I mean, is that what you always wanted to be? So, I mean, you know, what made you switch? I mean, I mean, I, again, you mentioned that so lawyers are a dime a dozen and was that it or, you know, and you just have this passion, discovered this passion. How did you really get into that passion and what were the steps that just transitioned you into that? And you're right to go back there because I told you how I got into computers, but the data part of it was a little, a little bit more fun. So I had a professor named Al Davis. There's actually a billion of them out there, but uh, this was a, a very special Al Davis and he gave us a whole bunch of papers 
as a graduate student exercise and he hands out these papers and they're papers that are going into a journal. And he says, I want you to, to evaluate them and decide whether or not you're going to accept them for publication. And you have four choices, accept, accept with revisions, uh, send back a bunch of suggestions or reject it outright. Uh, and, and the graduate students are around the table and we got together, of course, as grad students do. And what do you think about these things? And we all kind of went, uh, you know, this, this is not looking good. We don't like what we're seeing here, but they're all his friends, you know? So of course he did the, the usual correct thing, which is to set us around the table and then surprise us and say, okay, here's a piece of paper. You tell me right down how you're voting on these things. And he got back and we were all, actually we said, if, you know, if we're forced to do it, we'll vote to reject him. We'll all, you know, that's our pact among us, the suicide pact, I guess it was. And uh, uh, he pulled all the stuff together and said, you voted to reject all the papers. And I would have done exactly the same thing. It's a bunch of crap, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay dodged a bullet on that one. But what he was describing, Shannon, was the fact that when you look at requirements, doing things more at the beginning of the project to help the overall architecture and context of the project will do more to save money over the long run than anything else we've figured out what to do. So that focused my attention from all of IT to the requirements portion of IT and said, what we need to do is understand what we're trying to do, because if we ask the wrong question, we will definitely get the wrong answer. And remember, IT at this point still, even today in 2022, is about as good as one in three. One in three IT projects succeeds with full functionality on the schedule as promised within the cost range originally specified. My dentist was that bad, I'd get the heck out of town, right? Find somebody else to, to work around a sensitive. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, no, no way, right? And yet, what can we do? Well, we focus more on the requirements. Now, there's a very simple economic argument. If you do something that costs a penny during that requirements process, and correct it for a penny, turns out the cost of fixing that during design, which is the next stage down the line. Again, you plan, then you make a plan for how you're going to implement the original concept and then you do it, uh, you know, as the overall process. This gives the opportunity where you say, hey, what is it that's gonna, it's gonna cost 50 cents, not one penny, 50 cents to do it there. So obviously it makes sense there. Well, if you go to the extension of that, where you implement the system, it's 2000 times more expensive. And so more we can work that into our context and consciousness. And it's not part of, you know, of undergraduate education. Uh, you know, would you go into an ERP situation if you knew it was going to tie up tens of millions of dollars of investment funds in maintenance of, of systems that really deliver questionable value when you look at all the rest of the things that you have to do to get them to work uh, around that? I digress a bit. That's requirements, yes, right? That, that's the beginning. <laughs> I like, I like digression. <laughs> the next thing that happened was, what is then the most part that you can contribute the most to, that you can make a contribution? This is how you're trained as a graduate student anyway. The world's a big place. You want to try and solve some problems around it. And so looking at the data requirements, it turns out that they are the most objective, the most testable, the most quantifiable, the most machine learning friendly, uh, you know, you can add all sorts of other characteristics about them that describe them as this really unique asset. And so that's where I decided to get into data was to look at it from that perspective. And ever since then, I've, I've enjoyed helping organizations, people and things do interesting things with those. And I, I was fortunate that the Department of Defense, where I worked for about 10 years, um, taught me in one form or another to make a decent presentation that some people like to listen to. And so in that sense, I can tell those stories over and over again. And you have made a very good effort to allow me a platform to tell those stories. And I hope other people find those stories helpful in, in terms of the same sense. But yeah, that's a, a sort of a nutshell story of data is the part we can make the biggest change on. And if I sound very Steve Jobsian like that, you know, I'll take the inspiration. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, it's a great, uh, I love it. No, it's, it's great. So, so you found it in your graduate program. So what's your, what's your bachelor's in? Uh, administration and management and information systems, double major. Awesome. Computers were cool. And then, so what, uh, what are the additional degrees? What's your uh, master's and doctorate? I did a master it in those days it was a master's in business with a concentration in information systems. Now we have a full master's in information systems. Um, but again, I eat the dog food, if you will. I did the two VCU degrees there and, and was very happy uh, with them and, and was fat and happy sitting around at the VCU computer center where I was working full time at that point. Uh, and I was um, 
in charge of their online services and databases and telecommunication systems and all that. Uh, and it, you know, things were great. And my master's program advisor, Dr. John Sutherland, came into me one day and said, oh, by the way, Peter, I signed you up for a PhD program the other day. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Seriously, that was my attitude too. I just said, you're kidding, right? And he's like, no, you're, I can see you're having a lot of fun. You need to go out and learn how to have some real fun. And I will thank him to this day for that uh, particular set of inspiration. So true to his word, he had sent a note up to Dean Andy Sage at the School of Information Technology and Engineering at George Mason and said, hey, you should check out this guy. And uh, I actually showed up for work about two months later. First time I've ever given two months notice at a job. Wow. Probably a bad idea. I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> you know how that is when you you get blamed for everything when that goes wrong. Well, it turns out that's a time-based function. So they forget. Like I'm still here at the table, right? You're blaming me for stuff, and I'm I'm right here. <laughs> we can fix this right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a, a truly interesting experience. And Mason was a tiny school in those days, and it's grown like VCU has done a great job uh, up there. And I met a lot of friends, and, and again, got me into a, a totally different career space. So, so let's, so talk to me about that. So what was, so it was, was that first job? Um, you've discovered you love data and uh, in college. And so, you know, what job did you get to use it? It's interesting when you're doing your graduate degree, if you're full-time employed by the university as I was, and I was very fortunate to, to be, you know, scholarships and other things that they threw at me to, to, to keep me around. And I had no problem. I was totally dedicated to the program once I got started with it. But you end up looking at this thing as a business in this type of a school. And I don't mean to say it's overly bad. It was, a, again, an engineering school. There is a very fine business school at George Mason as well, but this was not that. But nevertheless, I was at that point um, making a fairly good salary as a director of the hypermedia laboratories. Ever heard the word hypermedia? Uh, not in a while, no. Uh -uh. It doesn't mean anything. It's like multimedia, but it sounds cool. <laughs> right? And so we were doing, you know, that kind of read. And we had a, a Department of um, Transportation, I believe, grant that we were yeah. working on, again, with clients working on, and I was working on the data problems. I was director of the laboratory. I was responsible for making sure the funding was secure and everything like that. And again, fat and happy uh, at, at George Mason. Very, very uh, happy there. And a colleague of mine who I knew from other days um, who worked at the Defense Department called me up and said, hey, if you go to this high school on this particular date, we have an open recruiting session. <laughs> if you're the right kind of information engineer, which I know you are, Peter, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, you know, we can get you into the Defense Department here. And so I ended up coming on board with them just a few uh, months later after that. And I worked for something called the Defense Information Systems Agency, and I had a wonderful title. I was the DOD Reverse Engineering Program Manager. Wow. What, what does that mean? That's what did the first you thing do? I had to find out. <laughs> okay. yeah. Really, Shannon, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, yeah. I worked with a wonderful gentleman named Russ Richard, who really understood the program. And reverse engineering is part of re-engineering. And if you think about re-engineering, what you're doing is you're understanding the things that are good and bad about the existing system, uh -huh. bringing forward that knowledge into the new system and reusing it. And I know that sounds like a very basic idea, but you'd be amazed how many times it does not occur. In fact, I've won lawsuits uh, around that because uh, as a supporting character in the process, I don't two people, but the, the, what happened is, is that organizations know they should do this and they don't because it sounds like it's more work than it's worth. Whereas again, I just said the concentration on that stuff early on at the requirement stage is where you're going to save the most money. So there's both an economic case and a risk case that you can make uh, in terms of looking at that. And I learned that from you know, hundreds of hours of DOD projects as well as uh, other projects that I've worked on uh, at the university as well since then. So you said, how long were you at the DOD? Uh, I was full-time for about two years. Then I came back to VCU. I just happened to see a position open. Dr. Gene Gason, who is another one of my mentors from previously, uh, ended up having a position in the department that she opened. And, and I joke, Jim Wynn hired me the first time in 1978, but he hired me the second time in 1993. So a long-term long relationship with Jim and a very good friend. I like it. So uh, when did you start branching out into consulting and to... Um education and evolving it so let's see if i can phrase this in a way that will go down easy for everybody because i uh, <laughs> to be blunt in some of my speak and i don't want to do that so 
what had happened was at the Defense Department, after I finished these series of reverse engineering projects, they literally ordered me to write a book. They said, you must write this down. I said, well, are you allowed to ask that? You know, can you really make somebody write a book? Because I'd never written a book before. And they said, little boy, do you want to ask that question twice and see what happens the second time you ask it? Okay, I'll get started on writing the book. So I went away and <laughs> typed it up and came up with a data reverse engineering if anybody's really interested in it. The better version is a condensed version in the IBM Systems Journal, which is available on my website, anythingawesome.com. There we go, a little plug in for that one. You can move that <laughs> along. Um, the key, though, is to understand that contextually, we do have some techniques that are more useful than others. So, so you're asking how that transformed though. So I've got this book out called Data Reverse Engineering and why anybody would be interested in that as a subject is, is really questionable. And if they hadn't ordered me to write it, I don't think I would have written it perhaps as a book. And as I said, I think that I did a better job the second time coming back and writing it more succinctly in the IBM Systems Journal article. Um, also, there's a key metadata model in there that was not in the book. Uh, that, that is in the IBM Systems Journal, for those of you that are interested in the technical aspects of it. I'm at my office at the university one day, and we're always encouraged, as I mentioned before, the experiential learning, the idea of connecting these students. So understanding VCU student base is a, a good import um, contextually. Many of these students are first in their generation, first in their family to go to school, so they don't have good role models. Uh, and things like that to rely on. So there's a, a fair amount of guardrails that we put up in the program to make sure that they're as successful as they possibly can be. And part of that is that I, when I was 14, I worked every afternoon. I worked full time from the age of 16 until, uh, uh, I guess now, um, I've had some times off perhaps, but uh, uh, mainly straight through. These kids I'm encountering in the undergraduate class have never had a job in their life. They don't break leaves. They don't understand the process of showing up importantly for, uh, you know, interesting, um, um, sorry, not interesting, but, you know, even hygiene, right? We've had issues with that. Uh, so, yes, you've got to show up every day. You've got to be washed. You've got to, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, and again, then you get paid, right? That's how it works. Uh, right. Good work, and we'll, we'll get that process through for you. Um, so we were doing lots and lots of that. And I get a call in my office at the university, and it's, hi, my name is uh, such and such, and I'm the managing director of Deutsche Bank. Hmm. Okay. What can I do for you, sir? He said, well, I think you've done something that we need to do. Uh, okay. What is that? He said, well, here's the deal. And this is high-level managing director who's describing to me the 9 million lines of legacy COBOL code that they have in their very valuable asset, something called um, DB Trader, which was the, the high-end trading system that they had. There were three characteristics of this. Uh, one, it was the only online system, so they could query it in real time. It wasn't batch. Two, it was multi-currency, so they didn't have to do currency conversions external to the system. And three, it was table-driven, which meant the architecture could add new FinTech products that we would call now. And these guys were the pioneers in that FinTech area uh, in those days because they had a really good system that worked really, really well. But it was on mainframes that were being sunsetted. Yes, we had problems with that even back in the 90s. Uh, this was on Wang COBOL. You may have heard of a Wang computer. Again, I was very familiar with them because VCU purchased the university professors that were associated with the Wang University and bought their master's program and brought them in. Again, very good deal, wonderful people that we were able to learn from uh, in that process. Here's Deutsche Bank with this massive significant asset in terms of financial positioning. And they can't find the IBM saying, we're not going to emulate the, the Wang COBOL anymore on this new platform here. It's too old, just as Apple sunsets their products. So this is going to sound nuts, Shannon, but the relationship that we developed with Deutsche Bank there over a three-year period was about $5 million. And we were flying groups of students up and back to New York City on a regular basis. We had put students up in NYU's overflow dorms because they had extra space and capacity. These were deals that we were able to make between Deutsche Bank and VCU and a very successful collaboration. And a couple hundred students went through that process and benefited in immense ways. Most of them, of course, sucked right up into Wall Street because we were charging Wall Street at that point in time, 25 bucks an hour, whereas we were charging, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, paying the students 25 bucks an hour, which in the 90s was a good salary. And uh, 
uh, we were charging the banks 50 bucks an hour and our overhead rate at VCU was 8%. And again, I'm saying this on the record because these are, somebody's probably going to come back and want to see these, these things. Yeah. Some other. So when I was doing that in the university days, they said, okay, go down to uh, what's called Office of Sponsored Research. It's over in the basement of Sanger Hall, which is in our health systems campus, and find a guy there named Chuck Chermside and negotiate a rate with him. And I made an appointment, went down to see Chuck. He looked at me across the desk and said, you okay with 8%? And I said, yep, that was the end of the conversation. From then on, I was charged 8% overhead in the university area. That was fine. And that was for applied research. We had a lot of papers, a lot of books that came out of that particular line of research, even though we also happened to make some money for and give some students some good experiences in the process. We went a little further than that. Uh, but what happened at the end of that process was about 1998, if I recall, VCU, like many of the other universities, realized that they could take the overhead rate from a certain fixed level and make it much higher. And we went from literally eight to currently we are 58% overhead in today's rate, which meant that the amount of service that any of our clients were getting through that previous mechanism had been halved uh, in that process. So they looked around and said, do you have intellectual property that you can help us declare and get started the company that you can get started, which is Data Blueprint? I think we came up with that about the same time you guys came up with Dataversity. Uh, so we were both kind of on the cutting edge there as, as far as getting that. And so um, again, with VCU's help, we declared some intellectual property to them. I say we, the company, basically they own most of the thoughts out of the company as well. We own uh, trademarks in particular in the area of something called the data doctrine. So we're, we've published two pieces in that area, what it means to be part of the data doctrine. That gets to a different issue, which we're trying to work with as a community. When somebody wants to be more data centric, what does that mean? Everybody would certainly say, yes, we would like to be more data centric. Now what, right? So we put some things in place and we can come back to those if you decide that's a, an interesting area to go or hold a webinar on it or something wrong. Or something. <laughs> Lots of webinar material here. You know, hey, so that brings us to a good point though. Um, in a, so what is your definition of data and, and how do you work with it today? And how do you teach it? So there's a very nice definition that we used in the Defense Department by a fellow named Dan Appleton. And I've not had anybody disagree with this so far. Uh, the, the key is that we can put a fact out there, the number 42, some random fact. Now, you may know 42 as, as Jackie Robinson's jersey. You may know 42 as life, the meaning of the universe. Uh, you may know 42 as uh, my age. Um, no, that's not right. It can't be that old. Anyway, uh, 28 years ago, maybe. 18. <laughs> can't do that. Isn't that funny how we lost a few people. years ago? Exactly. <laughs> I am an age past 40, so you know, whatever, it makes it better. Congratulations. <laughs> and now yeah. I've lost my train of thought completely, Shannon. What was the, the definition of data and, and how do yeah. you work? Yeah. So 42, right? We'll just put that out there as a random fact. And you've seen already that we can attach different meanings to that specific fact reasonably. Yeah a datum, which is the proper way to say it, although nobody does, is to say that that 42 is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. End of story. That association between that fact and that meaning is data. Now, the next question people ask is, so what's the difference between data and information? Turns out information, we can do the same association here. We have a fact and a meaning. We can take that datum and put another piece up that says, it becomes a piece of information when somebody asks for it. Okay. So once again, there's a tangible ask in there. Hey, Shannon, how many of these happened? Or what happened with this or whatever? There's a tangible specific request that makes it information. That also means right away that if you're trying to manage your data and your information separately, you're chasing your tail around in circles because it's too much work to try and keep them separated. Because obviously it's not just a thing, is it a fact or a data or a, an information, but at what point in time is it a factor in information and that makes it a real tough problem to solve. All right, we can go one step further than that because everybody said, great, I got information. Now I need to get smart about it. So that third layer that we say there is using that information strategically. What is it that we found that the organization can do strategically with that information in order to leverage it? For example, and this is my favorite example currently today, you know how bad things are for the poor airlines. Even this week, there've been thousands of flights canceled. It's just gotta be you know, complete awful thing to be working in that. And I'm saying as I'm getting ready to make a trip, right? So uh, you know, that's the way it works. Yeah. But um, if we look at 
what's happening in the airline industry, they're not valued very much. Basically, uh, American Airlines, which is one of the big ones, is six billion, I think, and the uh, United is nine billion uh, valued as the marketplace valued. However, both companies have been offered deals in the $20 billion range to obtain their frequent flyer data that they have in there. The difference between those, aside from being several billion dollars in difference, is the difference in knowing how to exploit that data, knowing what to use strategically and what not. It would be the kind of thing where Delta Airlines might say to somebody, hey, we haven't heard from you for a while. Is there something we can do to help get you into this particular piece? Or we saw that you were on Travelocity the other day because they know when you're out there, right? Uh, you know, Why did you choose this flight instead of that flight uh, in, in order to give us a particular answer? Again, much more that they could do, but in $20 billion in both airlines. Now, probably it's not all 20 billion, but it's certainly not nothing. And so the question is, how do we go about valuing that particular component, getting people to look at it as a strategic asset that we can leverage? You know, um, to understanding data further and kind of what you built your passion around, and we get this question all the time in webinars, you know, what is the ROI of data? And I know we can do a whole webinar on that topic, but you know, how do you define the value of data? I mean, you're talking about it in terms of billions of dollars. How does it translate to that? So it does. And that's the really interesting part is that most people haven't done the work to do that translation. And it turns out it's not all that hard. First of all, let's throw a shout out to Doug Laney for helping to popularize the concept uh, around that in, with his uh, Infonomics book. It's a, a wonderful addition to the uh, discussion in there. And he's done a really, really fabulous job with that. The, the, key there is to realize that the leverage in data is in finding what Tom Redmond calls hidden data factories. Now, it's really not necessarily a great name, but if you think about it, it's where Department A is working on something and they hand it off to Department B. And the first thing Department B does is change this back to this because they always set that setting wrong or forget to do something like that. And they can't make it go back to the first step. Uh, in order to do that. And those are all over your organization. Unfortunately, we use the phrase dying by a death of a thousand cuts, right? Well, the problem is nobody's dying, right? So you're unfortunately unnecessarily bleeding from a lot of places. And if you reduce that, it would be 20 to 40% of IT budgets for most organizations, 20 to 40%. Now, one thing I wouldn't want to be in today's environment is a CIO. Their job is hard enough, but the one thing that they can count on as a CIO is that their budget next year will be much less than the budget this year, because everybody's got it in their mind that going to the cloud is going to save people money. Um, done carefully, it can, but most organizations, just as they don't deliver on time, within budget, within schedule uh, functionality, uh, sorry, within the cost, third one, um, they also again, don't do a good job when they move to the cloud. And uh, we can get into another whole issue around that, but uh, it's a wonderful inflection point and a very good place to look. And just uh, as a simple piece of guidance, I would never put any data in the cloud that I didn't at least have a good idea of some of its quality characteristics. Uh, some people think that means it has to be of high quality. I don't think that's the case. It has to be of known quality. And that's a big difference in that. But what we do is we tend to just say, it's almost free, so we'll stick it out there and then die when our next Amazon web service bill comes and hits us. <laughs> so CIO in this context is chief information officer. Absolutely. Sorry if I wasn't. No, no. That's another piece that I'll just put on the record here, which is kind of fun. Um, I've been involved in development of two pieces of federal legislation. And the first one was the law that came about uh, that called into action the CIOs. Um, it's not that they didn't exist before, but the federal government made it a mandate that somebody needed to be in charge of IT. And so it's like one throat to choke uh, kind of thing. And I was consulted on that law and, and very happy to uh, contribute to it. Uh, again, it hasn't really stemmed IT costs of increase, but it has at least given us some, it's the law, so we should do it. It's a good thing. That's a good place to be. Second one is this new thing called the Federal uh, Evidence-Based Process uh, Policy Act. And FIPA has done three things in particular. One, it has made all data in the government open by default with obvious exceptions for um, sensitive data. Two, it's mandated the use of a chief information officer. Excuse me, I said that wrong. A chief data officer that is not 
the chief information officer. Right. I think that's a very interesting task. So when, when businesses do that, I say, well, one third of the economy is now working with that as an experiment. Do you want to sit back and watch or do you want to participate? That's a reasonable question. Organizations can decide how much appetite they'd like to have for that. Our third piece of the FIBA law is though is really interesting. It's now against the law for any lawmaker uh, in the federal government to decide, and again, I'll just make up an example here of the Department of Education that says school type X is better than school type Y, whatever those are. I don't know, and I'm not, you know, that's not part of the discussion. But if you're going to make a policy judgment on that, the law is now that you must specify in advance that we're going to use this pile of data from here and this pile of data from here, and we're going to use this model. All of those public in the same way that open data is public. And then we're going to tell you how we're going to apply the algorithm, and then everybody can apply the same algorithm uh, in the same manner, which will lead to open transparency around this so that people can't uh, do this. So, you know, nobody's been arrested for not obeying the CIO law. Probably nobody will be arrested for this one. But we do at least have the interesting characteristic that the penalties are higher than HIPAA. Oh, everybody yeah. Goes, yeah, okay, that's yeah. serious. Mm -hmm. Again, we got way off track here, but uh, <laughs> fascinating stuff. Uh, well, but no, it's good. It, it, there's a, a really nice um, point in there. You know, you mentioned CDOs, chief data officers, who are relatively what are relatively new on scene, right? It's a fairly new job title that um, has been that's still growing in the, in the number. Worldwide. Yeah, and there's still a lot of questions about who they report to and where they live. You know, um, we see a lot of other jobs um, emerging. Uh, you know, in around data, we're seeing an increase in data modeling jobs and uh, data architecture. So, in terms of that, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs uh, working uh, in data increasing or decreasing over the next ten years? And why do you see that this evolution continuing, or is it going to change? What am I seeing? Good, good question. So one of the things that, that's been really interesting for me, again, just a slight digression as we move into the, the answer there, is that instead of just staying at VCU, I've been really fortunate to have been invited to spend a total of eight immersions, as I call them. Uh, so I, I spent a number of years working with Nokia in Finland, and that was just a tremendous experience with Deutsche Bank in Frankfurt, uh, doing, uh, you know, really on-site work, working with Wells Fargo for a, a period of three years and really doing some very exciting work. So I think I'm actually qualified to answer your question here, Shannon, and that is that there's a big gap right now between organizations that are doing this well who look at this. Now, I'll, I'll take it back to another story that I think John Bottega will recognize as well. Uh, I know you'd speak with him occasionally and, and, and cross paths with it, uh, the, that work group as well. Great, great folks over there. John wrote the first time he read my monetizing book, he said, this is nuts. This is what my CIOs think about. This is how we do this. This is, you know, if you did anything else, you'd, you'd not be doing your job. And I said, yes, John, but let's look at who your, your peers are. The, the chiefs of the largest, most sophisticated banking systems in the entire world, of course you guys have it. And they do a great job. And they are very generous with their time and energy to show the rest of us some of the things that they've learned in the, in the process of that. But the vast majority of organizations are just figuring out what data is, much less that they need a data leader of some sort to be in charge of, of that particular function. And so, as you mentioned, there's not a lot of them that are out there. But I have been fortunate to work with a number of organizations and, and really up to, to in depth. What we're seeing is there's tremendous growth in the rest of the world. And just in the same way that we've seen other parts of the world as they've opened up, they've skipped the copper wire. Uh, Shannon, one of the things you and I joke about all the time is my poor internet connection. And thank you whomever for, for keeping this uh, uh, up and running for us for this, this time, it's almost a miracle. The other thing is my, my power supply went off weirdly and just started beeping for some reason, I have no idea why uh, on that. But yeah, so everything's working right at the moment, but I'm at the other end of a twisted pair. And so my twisted pair of copper is a, a real problem. It's an impediment to the entire community that I live in here 20 miles north of Richmond, Virginia. Um, it just means that this part is gonna be internet poor for a long time. I get two megabits to the desktop and 0.3 megabits back up. Yes, uh, again, if you have questions about whether that works for you, just go to a, a website called fast.com and see what it tells you your numbers are. Uh, you'll be amazed, it's a lot more than two and 0.3. Let's just say like that, yes. uh, so, so that process. 
these these emergence though have have shown me that where where the growth is expanding is way beyond most of our peripheral visions here. And I, I mean, like Jenny, you're seeing growth overseas in terms of the webinars and the marketing that you're doing as well. We're experiencing exactly the same thing and they are coming along and they're saying, you know, we could lay copper wires to everybody's house and do all that sort of thing. But if we just put it on the air, it'd be a lot cheaper and faster. We just turn it on, you know, just like that. So they're getting that and they're jumping and they're not making some of the mistakes that we've made on the way up. And, and we're seeing a lot more of that growth uh, out there. And I think it's going to be up to us to help our organizations try to realize the true expense of what happens there. And that's, you know, gets to this, this other component of being able to put a dollar amount on some set of values. Uh, again, I can tell you lots of stories around that, but having those examples and knowing that other people could do it, the, the goal is to inspire and to try to say, can you find these patterns in your organization? Uh, just the same way that Len Silverstein created all those data modeling patterns. Are you looking to learn how to implement a successful analytics strategy? Join us on October 19th for six live expert-led sessions at Enterprise Analytics Online. Register for free at eanalyticsonline.com. Well, you know, to that point, you know, especially as a professor, you know, do you see un universities, you know, changing what they're teaching, how they're teaching it? Uh, I know you have, a, um, and, you know, are you, how do you advise uh, people to get started, not just at the executive level, where, where do they go from there? You know, how to become a data architect or a data scientist, or, you know, is that a good career choice? So you um, have to introduce it before it gets to graduate school, because yeah. that's the first that's a barrier, right? I mean, that's just sure. keeping away a lot of people from that. So yeah, become, having that introduced as a, an elective at the undergraduate level, we have, I, I could tell you one of my more inspiring, um, I was on the receiving end of inspiration. I don't know what that is, inspired moments. Is that the way you say it correctly? But, but we were going through, and, and what we do in my, my in-person class that met this semester uh, was that we went through a whole series of a design exercise. And we got to the part where somebody was actually laying out the interface. And this individual came to class and just went, I was so excited doing this assignment. I had the, you could just tell she was lit up and, and just you know, going to go off in a career in that general direction. We will find those if we look for them and make ways so that they can become part of the conversation. But if we don't mention it at all, which is what our current situation is, they discover us after about 10 or 15 years in IT. And that's a lot of wasted time that we really need to focus on trying to eliminate that big, big gap that we have in there. Again, I'm mixing DEMA stuff up with the academic stuff, but I see it as all related. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, what is your advice to somebody who is just getting discovering, you know, data, it's a career in data management, whether it be an analyst or, or a data architect or whatnot, you know, what's their, your best advice and how do you keep up to date and the latest and greatest and um, any words of wisdom and how to uh, make a successful career and really learn about data? It has to do, let me tell a data science story. This is not to knock data science because we saw exactly the same pattern occur. If you remember, we went through the MDM work. Uh, you know, you always have focused on the whole uh, enchilada, right, of data diversity, but there was one group that got in and said, MDM is going to solve all of our problems. Uh, and then we saw exactly the same pattern, which is that people became allied to the technology and not concerned with the business context here. So I, I'm telling the story about data science. It's not to pick on data scientists or anything along those lines, but it's a, a combination of two things that occurred. One, uh, an individual went and ran into the, the CEO of the company at one point, just in a casual conversation. Hi, Shannon, we're in the same elevator together, assuming it's loud, right? Uh, you know, and mentioned to the fact that we had gotten to an 86% solution on one of the things that we were making work uh, progress towards. And the reaction was very different. Now, I'm already a very pink person here, but I'm going to go, <laughs> like, just to, you know, make steam <laughs> coming out of my ears and all that sort of thing. Young, young person, we never do anything at this organization less than 110%. And I do not want to hear from you until we have got, you know, just completely missed the picture, right? It's just a two ships passing in the night, miscommunication. Sorry, it was corrected, no problem. But what was interesting about it was that on further investigation, the organization discovered that even the 86% solution was too much. That if the, the data scientists had understood the business context in which the problem was attempting to be solved, they would have solved it at a 70% solution, 
two years prior. And that's a lot of time, which translates into a lot of uh, resources and money on this. So the key is, it doesn't matter what aspect of technology that you're interested in, what aspect of data that you're interested in. Um, what you've got to do is be able to relate that to some component of the business value. And it's not that hard to do. If you just start practicing, it's kind of like writing in a journal or taking notes or other things that we do. I'm trying to think of a musical analogy, Shannon, because you and I are both musicians. And so we have, you know, we understand the value of practice uh, yeah. from that perspective and, and that there's some things that can't be learned without practice. And that, that goes for enterprise architecture and much of this data stuff as well. You can read it in a book and you will understand step one, step two, step three. And then you discover that somebody forgot to change the date field from here to here. And now you don't have access to your uh, uh, you know, tool that you used to use. So you're gonna have to try to do it with Excel. And oh my goodness. No. Again, these are the things that take our knowledge workers in general, much broader than just data people. Knowledge workers in general spend 80% of their time trying to do their job and 20% of the time actually doing their job. So they're creating work products that are redundant. They're doing all kinds of things that are simply not helpful. They're searching for information. Again, they're asking their, their colleagues for it. And this is just a, a terrible waste of our resources. If you can remember, Shannon, I know you lived during this period, so you might not have been aware of it, but they kept talking about irrationally over exuberance and trying to figure out why the stock market was going up as it was during the Clinton years. And the answer, they think after reflection is that technology helped us become more productive. And that was an unknown technology dividend that kind of goosed our economy and helped. And that's a great thing. No, I'm not complaining about it at all. This is the next area that can do that kind of work for us. When you look at what are, we're asking our knowledge workers to do, uh, again, I just onboarded for my eighth uh, um, immersion here. And the onboarding process was beautifully done. These guys have been practicing. They really, it was a nice onboarding process. I've showed up for places where they've spelled my name wrong. And because it's a key field, it sticks with you for the entire duration of your, you know, I don't really care yeah. that my name is spelled wrong. It's just kind of awkward when people are looking for you and trying to spell your name, you know? Oh, we've all had bad data experiences for sure. <laughs> but uh, uh, do you have to be interested in technology first? I don't think so. Your career in data management? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, again, I, I think what we've noticed over the years is that there's a high correlation between musicians and mathematicians. Now, you don't have to be mathematical either, but if you are mathematical, you're likely to do this. But if you're a musician, you're likely to be sympathetic to it. And I think that there's another class of workers that also stand out as, as very useful over the years that I've been doing this, and really four decades at this point, um, but it's restaurant workers. And the, the key there is that if you're working in a business, you're typically either a service business or a product business. It's you know, hard to change from one to the other uh, in that sense. And yet in the restaurant world, you have to be good at both. It's production in the back room and it's uh, service out front. And people who do that and understand that tend to understand systems and tend to make uh, good. So all of the things equal with two candidates, I'll take one that's worked in a restaurant, again, that, you know, comes across well and all the rest of that uh, in there. And there's, there's so many opportunities for people like that. Think about, so right now, Shannon, our growth rate in data is going like this and our ability to analyze it is uh, messing my hands up here totally, much lower at a rate, right? I should put it by, this is where I could rely <laughs> on my power. It's going this way and then our rate of yeah. then this way. Uh, uh, give up, right? Giving the, the, the the students and trying to you know get back to what we were yeah. really focused on which is trying to help these people i mean yeah sure in some cases we have been teaching students incorrectly all right uh, for example you know what a case tool is but if you were to ask a 30 year old they wouldn't know what a case tool is it's gone from their vocabulary just like they don't anymore know how to sign their name on something because we haven't taught them script by the way, an interesting part about the scripting, if you remember back, and you may not have had this, so let, let me know, but when I was there, they gave us ruled paper, very much like the bricks that you have behind us. And they said, it's too high, you leave one between, you're allowed to make a lowercase letter that's half height and you have to touch the top of that thing. And then through an uppercase letter, you have to touch the top of that part of it. And it gave you objective criteria, literally guide rails. 
that we can right. watch it. We don't even tell people that data is a career option. How are they going to get excited about it? How are they going to know that it's a useful function? And people rely on IT and IT doesn't actually know that much about data either because they've all been taught exactly one course in database uh, in data, which is how to make a brand new database. And if there's one skill we do not need more of on planet Earth, it is how to build a new database. Do we wonder when we have a problem with too many databases and the only thing we've taught people for the last 30 years is when you have a problem with data, build a database? Now, it doesn't matter whether you call it a data lake or a data lake house or a warehouse or any of the other things, it's still another pile of data. And, and our goal should be simplicity rather than complexity in terms of what we're trying to do because the world is tough enough to get uh, across with messages, much less with data uh, in terms of how people are going about it. So do we need to start advocating uh, high school? <laughs> do we need to start advocating earlier, start uh, a movement and letting people know that this is out here? Or you know, do we just have people continue to fall into those roles and just send, I, you know, I've had emails saying, I just got this job I, as a title, as a data right. modeler. What do what I do? do? I <laughs> what, what does Probably. that mean? I'm, I'm looking about for my later literacy book so I can wave the cover about uh, on that to, in order to do that. That really does get to sort of the heart of the matter because if we argue about it as an IT problem, we're missing most of the rest of the world, which is where most of the action is. Um, IT is important and it's things that we should do, but we also need to focus on what I call the knowledge workers. So what Todd and I did in the, the data literacy book, Shannon, was to, to take and divide the world up into objective criteria. And again, it goes back to, it's, it's just clearly a passion of mine. If you can make it something that everybody looks at and says, you're on the fifth brick, you know, counting from the left or whatever it is you're doing, everybody can agree on that, that factual basis. So of classes of people that are out there in the world, there are close to 8 billion human persons on the planet Earth. Uh, of those, about 2.5 billion with a B have a mobile device of one kind or another, uh, some sort of a rectangle or get that in focus. Right. There, no, it's still not, I have an invisible iPhone. This is really You cool. do. <laughs> so um, that's a group of people that really does need some data education. And I'm not advocating or silly enough to believe that we could go out there and take the mobile phones away from everybody so you're going to get them back when you can pass this test. You know, that's, the world doesn't work that way. But we can have starting to have conversations with uh, people what we call responsible adults uh, who are responsible for, for these mobile data spreaders. And we can also lock down their phones. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, if you go out now as a young person, you're going more likely to get a call from somebody that you don't know than a call that somebody that you do get. Uh, we, uh, of the more mature generation, people don't bother us as much. Although I did have an interesting experience just last night, Shannon, which you'll find interesting. We got Zoom bombed in a uh, kind of official no. meeting. Yeah, it was horrific. Oh, uh, no. And, yeah, it just, wow, people actually waste their time doing that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, anyway, back to our, our, our <laughs> topic here trying to, to understand where it is that we can make a difference and, and yeah. looking at these uh, younger people coming along here. I've been so fortunate in my career to be colleagues and friends with so many great individuals. Uh, Clive Finkelstein, who just passed away. Uh, John Z, who's uh, uh, unfortunately uh, suffering a bit right at the moment as well. So uh, wish him well. Um, Lots and lots and lots of other people, and I'm sure you're going to capture them in the series, which is just absolutely wonderful uh, from that perspective. Hopefully, we'll be able, and I know you're doing a careful job of curating it, uh, this will become a resource for other folks to take a look at when they uh, finally get around to saying, okay, now it's my turn to start doing this because there's nobody else left, and I am the person who knows the most about data in our organization right at the moment, which makes me the data leader for that organization, and now I have to start doing something uh, that's going to help our organization do more with what they're trying to do. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Let me ask this one more question here. You know, you mentioned your book and data literacy. So first, let me ask, okay, so you wrote, you, the DOD forced you to write your first book, which is fascinating. So now how many books have you written? I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask, how many books have you written, Peter Egan? 
So 12 books at this point, and uh, really pleased. Uh, it uh, doesn't obviously uh, uh, make me wealthy as far as that goes, but I do get at least favorable feedback, and most importantly, corrective feedback from people, which is how we'll all make this, uh, this entire process better. I love it. And, and so, so data literacy, why data literacy? And, you know, this is also a fairly new term that's booming in the world of data management, right? So what is it and, and why is it uh, emerging and so hot right now? I'm a, a, a devotee of the concept called surveillance capitalism. And if this is your first time hearing that word, start Googling it, you'll see that uh, Shoshana Zuboff up at Harvard really coined the term, wrote a wonderful book on it, which is a fairly weighty tomb, but it's a wonderful book. And the idea is simply this, that uh, there is a class of organizations out there that really want your Shannon's data and they want to make money off it. Now, again, we've been talking about how to make this stuff pay for itself. And here's a group that's turned around and said, just by walking around and being a mobile data spreader, Shannon, uh, you are playing right into our hands and we can take that information that you have and monetize it and use it in ways to, to um, quote, help you out uh, through the process. Now, let's be very clear about the motives on this, which is so unfortunate. Their motive for this is to personalize the advertising that you don't listen to instead of just sending you random advertising that you don't listen to uh, on this. And the idea, of course, that once you start advertising that next leads you directly to behavior control. And if you go to the Cambridge Analytica scandal and see what's in there, they were able to manipulate entire countries' opinions by messing with their data. And that's a very unfortunate thing. The, the experiment literally was seeing things that are coming through a newsfeed type of capability. If we turn on certain switches and make them see happier or sadder type stories, that will influence them to become more enraged. And their enragement translates into dollars, both in terms of advertising, but also in terms of political action and can inflame political groups, uh, which we've seen, of course, plenty of evidence about that without getting on too weighty a topic there. Uh, anything else you want to uh, add? Well, I do think that the key behind all of this that we're doing is that if we're wrong about data, the data is the asset that you need to have, that it, it is, then somebody should kind of let us know and make a good business case and say, it, it doesn't matter. Just do whatever you need to do. Throw your data in the cloud. Don't use standardization. Don't try and, and uh, make a, a <coughs> me. don't try and make a, a very good case for your uh, efforts in this area. And, and what I tell people is that nobody in today's environment questions the value of an HR organization, right? You just can't imagine most major corporations saying, you know, it's a uh, cost cutting time again. I think we need to, that we, we don't, everybody's going to behave themselves. We won't need lawyers anymore. HR, and by the way, HR went through a transformation that I'm hoping our industry does as well, which is that about 80 years ago, and this is a story from John Ladley. Thank you, John, for giving me the opportunity to tell us. But about 80 years ago, HR was down at the work group level and work groups were thought to be able to determine best what their work group needs were, therefore the hiring should be local and that's how it was done. And we observed over time with the data that that wasn't the case and that standardizing those practices would result in a fairer environment and, and being able to uh, 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 even out and reduce risk and cost to the organization. So nobody thinks today, let's get rid of HR. I think we're done with it. And yet we look at data with that same longevity for the organization. And, and say, gosh, let's do this on a project basis. And basically on a project by project basis with an IT shop that is only 33% accurate. Um, that's just asking a lot to happen with data. And that's why it hasn't happened in the current way. And why we're saying there needs to be a change going forward so that we can do this. I've worked with two organizations right now that claim they are green fields. Let's start off with nothing else. We get to put our own data. We're going to design it right from the ground up. And they've already made several mistakes that I keep pointing out to them. And not, not to say that, you know, we don't want to hold them up. We understand the need to move quickly. But the idea is there are certain things that you need to make sure you get right on this. And if you don't get it right, we're going to be doing things like now, again, Shannon, you're in uh, Portland. And you've been on a 10 digit zip code now for many years, right? Yep. Poor Richmond, Virginia. You're my little enclave here. Uh, <laughs> just went on 10 digits last year. 
last last fall. Oh, terrible thing. What's the world coming to with 10 digits in a phone number? You know, because they didn't plan it out in the first place to, to get it. What if we run out of telephone numbers? Oh, that'll never happen. Well, again, Jenny, you have <laughs> one number, two numbers, three numbers, maybe. If you have an iPad with a wireless card, you might have four telephone numbers because that's what the system that they use. It wasn't just that they were telephones. It was telephone numbers that were used. And we ran out of them real quickly. These problems are not going to go away. They're going to continue to get worse. And we're going to need a class of people that can do exactly what you and I have been talking about today. And I'm so thankful that you provide an opportunity for folks to participate in these educational opportunities. Well, Peter, thank you so much, as always. It's such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you taking time. Uh, any, any ways for people to connect with you that you want to give a shout out for and where they can find your books? If, if you Google me, you'll, you'll, you'll be the first person at the top of Google for you uh, on that. My website's anythingawesome.com. I love it. Well, thank you. And thanks for taking the time again. And thanks to all of our listeners out there. And if you'd like to keep up with to date on the latest podcasts and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.